Good morning and thank you for joining us for today's service at New Testament Bible Church. Let's join Pastor Malcolm Milam for today's message. Good morning. Um, let us pray and immediately get into the word. Um, I'm excited what God has for us today. Uh, we are still discussing, we're still having our sermon series on the miracles, the feeding of the 5,000. And if you've been taking this journey with us uh, the last several weeks, we are at a hiatus. We're at this really high point. And today, uh, we're going to have a discussion about church hurt. Now, we're still having a discussion about the feeding of the 5,000. Um, but we're going to have a discussion about church hurt. And it will tie in to the feeding of the 5,000. So let us pray and immediately get into the word. Oh, blessed Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you, Lord, thanking you, Father, for today. Uh, we trust you and believe you and believe in you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that your word falls on good ground. Uh, you are wonderful, Father God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that uh, you continue to, to show us your face. You continue to show us who you are uh, in this sermon series. Uh, we thank you, Father, for Jesus. We thank you, Father God for the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you want to title, if you want to title um, this segment, it's called Church Hurt. Does this offend you? Church Hurt. Does this offend you? Uh, our foundation scripture will be the same foundation scripture that we've had uh, for the past several weeks. Uh, it's found in uh, the book of John, I'll be reading from the New King James Version, uh, chapter 1, 1 through 14. Uh, the scripture reads, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. And Him was life. And the life was the light of men and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it skip down to verse 10 it says he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him we're talking about Jesus he came to his own and his own did not receive him but as many as received him to them he gave the right to become children of God those who believe in his name who were born not of blood nor of the will of flesh nor of the will of man but of God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory and the glory as the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth our key terms and we're at the section we're at the portion uh, of our sermon um, where we're, and I said this last week, where we're going to, we're going to, these definitions, these terms are going to be highlighted. So apostasy, apostasy, we're going to see this here pretty soon. Uh, apostasy, a falling away, a great withdrawal, a defection from the faith. Uh, believe, uh, adheres to, trust in, and relies on. Uh, deity, a supernatural being considered divine or sacred. Incarnate, this is the term applied to the appearance of the second person of the Godhead in the human form. In other words, God the Son coming to the earth as man. Let me do a quick aside. If you haven't been watching this uh, series you can go check us out on YouTube um, we have been discussing all the miracles well five excuse me seven specific miracles of Jesus uh, and we're currently talking about the feeding of the 5,000 and what we have here is now we are going through kind of like this timeline we're going through uh, this journey um, in the feeding of the 5,000. I want you guys to follow me here. So essentially what ended up, what, what happened was 
Jesus uh, went to uh, on a mountain, him and the disciples. Um, the people followed Jesus, and he had been doing some miracles. He had been healing the sick, and the people followed him, and Jesus looked down, and he seen him, and essentially he said, hey, uh, how are we going to feed these people? Uh, they had a discussion about money. Uh, then they had a discussion about sending the people away. And then we get to the portion where there was a little boy who had five loaves and two fish. So what Jesus did was he took the five loaves and two fish and he thanked God and fed 5,000 men. He fed the 5,000 men and there were women and children. So uh, uh, what we know is it was really about 10,000 people that Jesus fed. And as we go through this, now we get to a portion where there's a discussion about who is he. Jesus actually left um, and left, told, his, told the disciples to leave, and he would close out, for lack of better terms. And what he knew was that the people were going to try to force him and make him king. And then they had a discussion about what he had done. And there was this back and forth, and Jesus told them, hey, you guys are more worried about the miracle. You are more worried about getting fed than the individual who's feeding you. Let me say this. What Jesus was saying in a nutshell, don't put the miracle before the maker. So we go through this context. We're having these discussions, and Jesus is, is, is telling them, hey, I'm the bread of life. And they're saying, hey, well, give us this bread. Show us how you did this. And and he said, the only reason why you, that, you ha that we're having this conversation is because you, you got full. But there's a more intense, there's a more, let's talk about the spiritual fullness that I want for you people. We end up going through and he's having this discussion. He transitions and we end up in a synagogue. And now we're in the synagogue and now we're on our focus scripture. Our focus scripture is found in St. John uh, 6. St. John 6 and 67. St. John 60 through 67. 60 and 67. It says, Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? Now, when you look at the word disciples in the Hebrew term, uh, it could be considered, it could be said to be students. And so when we look at the disciples, depending on the context, yeah, we're talking about the 12, but then disciple can also mean student or learners. Verse 61, it says, When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? What then, if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were and, and who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless he has been granted to him by my father. For that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Key, think about what I'm saying. Many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? Now our objective has always been how did Jesus respond? How the people responded and the overall outcome. Now, as I stated earlier, uh Last week we ended our discussion where Jesus transitioned from the mountain to the synagogue. 
What we know is that the synagogue was essentially the church. Now, what I want to do today is give several definitions of the church. Uh, number one, uh, the church is a gathering place. Uh, the church is the called out ones. The church is the community of all true believers. Now, these are some big ones right here because what I did was I gave you some just some regular Webster definitions of the church. However, the church belongs to God. I'm going to say that again. The church belongs to God. Uh, 1 Timothy 3 and 15 reads, 1 Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy 3 and 15 reads, it says, But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourselves in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillars and the ground of the truth. So the church is supposed to be the pillars and the grounds for truth. The church belongs to God. Christ. Christ is the head of the church. So let's 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 play this out. The church belongs to God and Christ is the head of the church. Let's turn to Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1, 20 through 23. The church belongs to God and Christ is the head of the church. It says, which he produced in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, whether angelic or human, and far above every name that is named above every title that can be conferred. Not only in this age and world, but also in the one to come. Verse 22, it says, And he put things in every realm in subjugation under Christ's feet, and appointed him supreme and authoritative head over all things in the church, which is the body. The fullness of him who fills and completes all things in all believers. Wait a minute. So the church belongs to God. Christ is the head of the church. But this even said that the church, the church is his body. The church is his body. You remember we're having a discussion about church hurt. We're having a discussion about church hurt. We're having a discussion about the apostasy. We're having a discussion about people being offended. Are you offended? However, the church belongs to God and Christ is the head of the church. Here are several church functions. Here are several church functions that I believe are appropriate for our discussion about church hurt. The apostasy. Are you offended? Number one. Number one. One of the functions of the church is to evangelize to the world. Our job as a church is to evangelize to the world. It says in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. I'll be reading the New Living Translations. It says in 18, it says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all commands I have given you. And be sure 
of this. I am always, I am with you always, even to the end of time. One of the functions of the church is to evangelize to the world. Another one of the functions to the church is to guard the truth. So when you come to church, when you come to church, who Christ is the head of and God is the overarching king of all of this, when you come to church, you're supposed to guard the truth. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 2, 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 2, it says, Timothy, my dear son, and this is, we're talking, and these are coming from the Pauline epistles. It says, Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Jesus Christ. You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. Wow. As believers, we're supposed to teach the truths. And it says to other trustworthy people. Are you trustworthy with the truth? Are you telling the truth? Parents. Parents, I ask you. Are you passing these on? The truth to your children? So what we know is, is that the church is... is to evangelize to the world. We know that the church is to guard the truth. Now, the church is to edify the saints. Edify, edify, edify. The church is to edify the saints. In Ephesians 4, 11 through 15, Ephesians 4, 11 through 15, it says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. Wow. Christ gave the church gifts and the gifts that he gave to the church are apostles the prophets the evangelists the pastors and the teachers to our pastors to our evangelists to our prophets you are supposed to be a gift to the people verse 12 says their responsibility I like how it goes to what God has given what Jesus has given us as gifts, but then it talks about our responsibility. Their responsibility, my responsibility is to equip God's people, not my people, God's people, to do his work and build up the church. The body of Christ. Again, it says it again. The church is the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge. We're supposed to come to unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son, listen to this God, that will be mature in the Lord. I'm going to read that again. This will, continue, this will continue until we come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord. Are you mature in the Lord? We're going to talk about this word mature again. But I ask you again, are you mature in the Lord? It says, measure it up to the full and complete standard of Christ. There's a standard in Christ. It said, verse 14 says, then we, will no, then we will no longer be immature like children. It is amazing when you speak to people, people who have been in the body of Christ, a part of the church, and they're still immature. And this scripture says, immature like children. It says, we won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching we will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so so clever they sound like the truth. Wow, this is lies that sound so clever like the truth. Instead, verse 15, it says, Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way and more like Christ, who is the head, it says it again, who is the head of his body, the church. Another function of the church, another function of the church is to discipline the unruly. Let's see, not discipline the unruly. Let, let, me, let, me say, let me say this another little way. Another function of the church is to correct. Another function of the church is to correct. I have on here discipline the unruly. I, I, mm, 
I like to cor- I like the word correct. Uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 2 Corinthians 13, 1 through 10. And I know this is a lot of scripture. But again, we're having this discussion about the apostasy. We're having this discussion about church hurt. We're having this discussion about are you offended. But what we have learned is the church is the body of Christ. And I want you to think about the words that I'm using. The head of the church is God. Hmm. Who's over the church, who God put over the church with Jesus. Church hurt. We're doing some wordplay here. 2 Corinthians 13, 1 through 10. It says, this is the third time, and this is Paul. I want you, I want you guys to hear this. This is Paul having a discussion with some people in the congregation that uh, are in error. And this is Paul speaking. He said, this is the third time I'm coming to visit you. And as the scripture says, the facts of every case must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I have already warned those who had been sinning when I was there on my second visit. So this is this he talked about this. So he's already been there before. Now I again warn them and all others, just as I did before, the next time I will not spare them. I will give all, excuse me, I will give you all the proof you want that Christ speaks through me. Christ is not weak when he deals with you. He is powerful among you. Although he was crucified in weakness, he now lives by the power of God. We too are weak just as Christ was, but when we deal with you, we will be alive with him. And we will have God's power. I like this part right here. It says, examine yourselves. Examine yourselves. Examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Wow. It told you to examine yourself to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Test yourself. It says, examine yourself and test yourself. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. As you test yourself, I hope you will recognize that we have not failed the test of apostolic authority. We pray to God that you will not do what is wrong by refusing our correction. The church is supposed to correct. We're talking church hurt here. The church is supposed to evangelize to the world. The church is supposed to guard the truth. The church, the church is supposed to edify the believers. And now we're talking about correction here. Hmm. Correction. The church is supposed to correct. It says, I hope we won't need to demonstrate our authority when we arrive. Do the right thing before we come, even if that makes it look like we have failed to demonstrate our authority. For we cannot oppose the truth, but must always stand for the truth. We are glad to seem weak if it helps show that you are actually strong. We pray that you will become mature. There that word mature is again. Are you a mature believer? Are you the believer who, who moves on every, it said every different doctrine, every different win? Are you the one that, oh, okay, th- this, this, is not, this is not feeding my spirit? Are you the one who needs the light show and the dance ministry? There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing, there's no, there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with that, but Can we just get the word? It says, I'm writing this to you before I come, hoping that you won't need, that I won't need to deal deal, deal, deal severely with you when I do come. For I want to use the authority that the Lord has given me to strengthen you, not to tear you down. Church hurt. We're talking church hurt. Church hurt. Church hurt. About the mid-2000s, there was a phrase that took this momentum in the body of Christ, and the term was called church hurt. Church hurt stems from the experience 
experiencing someone else abusing of their power. Pastor, leader, apostle. Someone a believer has given influence. I'm going to say this again. So they've given the pastor, prophet. You got people believing in you and not in God. So we, we, church hurt. Church hurt is also a product of individuals manipulating people's minds, taking people's money, in the extreme cases, sexual misconduct and abuse. The misappropriation of scripture for the gain or power. First Timothy states in six, first Timothy six, three through five states, and I'm gonna be reading from the New King James Version. It says, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord our Lord Jesus Christ, and to do the doctrine which which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reveling, evil suspicions, useless wrang wrangling of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gains. But watch this. It says, from such withdraw yourselves. So I want you to think about what we just what Paul just described, it said you need to get away from them. Now again, consider what we're talking about. The church is the body of Christ. God is the head of the church. And as we kind of boil this down, it seems like we have put our faith in men. I'm going to say this and, and I might close. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, let me say this and, and uh, we'll continue this. We'll continue this next week. Yeah. The church is not ours. It's God's. The church the church's overseer is Jesus. And when you have a discussion about church hurt, when you have a discussion about church hurt, we have to be careful and be really specific with the word. We bless you, Lord Jesus. We honor you. You are great. And we appreciate you. We love you, Lord. Thank you for uh, this time of fellowship with you. Thank you for explaining. Explaining. Giving us practical application of what the church is, who the church is. You are the head of the church. We love you, God, and honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Did you enjoy today's message? Please give a love offering. Simply go to NewTestamentBibleChurch.com Click the online giving link and click give now. Type in your amount and complete the rest of the form. Thank you for your donation. The journey of life is often unpredictable and it is important to know your purpose in it. Receive Jesus today and learn about his plan for you. He is eagerly waiting to be a part of your life. The first step is salvation. Read Romans 10 and 9 and repeat this prayer. God in heaven, I believe in my heart that Jesus died on the cross for me and that you raised him from the dead. Jesus, I call on you now as my Lord and Savior. Please forgive me of all my sins. I will trust and follow you for the rest of my life. Amen. We look forward to you joining us for our next broadcast. Have a blessed week.